Hello, everybody, and welcome to this webinar on thermal disinfection and steam sterilization validation for reusable medical devices, a road trip for the U European and US market. So my name is Lisa, and I will be your uh, guide today. And as the title of this webinar already says, we're going to talk about reusable medical devices. These are devices that are used in the healthcare industry in an operating room, as you can see here. But what these devices have all in common is the following. These devices are used in the healthcare setting and are then processed, which means cleaned, disinfected and or sterilized and then reused again over and over again until their end of life cycle. Now, these processes are very important because these devices are reused over and over again. And these three steps, cleaning, disinfection and sterilization must be very uh, detailed and very performed correctly in order for the device to be safe for the patient. Now, today, we're only going to discuss two steps, which is the thermal disinfection and the steam sterilization. The steam sterilization is the last part of the processing cycle. The thermal disinfection can be the last part. Now, why is disinfection of a reusable device important? Disinfection is important to reduce the amount of microorganisms present on the device from the previous use. Sterilization, the word says it already, you want to be able to have a sterile device. For critical devices that comes in contact with the blood burial, you want to make sure that your device is sterile and that all microorganisms are killed. Now, how do you know if you're taking a new device that has been re reprocessed, that it is disinfected or that it is sterilized? So you look at, can you look at the device and see whether the sterilization or the disinfection procedure was performed correctly? Uh, for instance, when you clean a device, you can see whether or not it's clean. Now, if you look at a device which has, for instance, been sterilized, you actually do not know whether the, the process was, was, was performed correctly. So I call this, this is a black box. You, you take a device and you just have to rely on the process, which is in this day, or in this case, thermal disinfection or steam sterilization, whether it was performed correctly, you have to rely on that process. And because you have to rely on that process and it's a complete black box in the healthcare industry, it is very important that this black box, which is used all over time, that all these steps are validated. So the validation of the disinfection and of the sterilization procedure is really essential to demonstrate the effectiveness of that procedure to make sure that you have a safe device. So I hope that's clear. And as I promised today, we're going to make this fun, these validations. We're going on a road trip. This is our third road trip. And uh, last time we went uh, through Belgium, but this time we're going to do something else. So what we want to obtain or what we want to do is during this road trip, we want to obtain a passport which gives us access to the European and the FDA market. Now, as I said, we are going not going to travel in Belgium today, but we're going to travel in the desert. Now, it's very warm in the desert, thermal disinfection, steam sterilization. I think you can find the link. But walking in the desert can be dangerous, especially by yourself. You need a good guide. Uh, I, I already told you that, that I'm from Belgium. I'm, we don't have much experience with the desert here in Belgium. Uh, in my mind, there is no desert in Belgium. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. And also, I'm not so very good with heat. Uh, if you ask my family, I faint a lot when it becomes warmer than uh, 30 degrees Celsius. And therefore, as a present to you, I've asked uh, Jason Pope, our expert in steam sterilization from our facility in Salt Lake City, which is in the desert, to join me today to be your guide. So I've put myself on the back of a camel and let Jason also be our guide uh, today. So Jason, welcome also to join me uh, in this trip into the desert. Thank you. I'm happy to happy to be going on the journey with you. Yeah, and uh, you have been an expert in steam sterilization. Oh, uh, for for about 17 years. Um, I've been with Nelson Laboratories now for a total of 24 years, and um, I am a member of the ISO TC198 Working Group Three, which is the Moist Heat Working Group. So. Um, I'd like to think that that I am uh, educated for this journey. So. 
that sounds perfect. And I think for, for all of you, uh, the audience, that indeed we are now safe to travel in the desert and can stand a potential very, very high uh, temperatures. Now, on each road trip, we are always giving some hints, some travel choice awards. So now in the desert, uh, when you see you need to drink, you need to drink a lot to make sure uh, that, that you, in my case, don't faint. But if you see a picture of a water bottle that is like a tip, grab that bottle, hold on to it and use it in your advantage. When you're traveling in the desert and things becoming warmer and warmer, you can see these mirages. You, you think like there is a kind of very nice <laughs> sea or ocean where you can cool down, but that is a tourist trap. It is a reflection of the sun. It is too warm and you're not seeing it clearly. So avoid that. These are the potential traps, things you think are important to do during these types of validation, but which you should avoid. So look out for the water bottle, grab onto them. And once you see the mirage, please, Go away from them and drink a little bit of water to refresh yourself. So, of course, before you can start this trip with your reusable devices, you must make sure that you, your devices can stand heat. So if they are melt easily, then, of course, thermal disinfection or steam sterilization process is not applicable for your device. So take that as a first tip to start. And let's make the first uh, step towards the thermal disinfection validation. And let's talk about that. So thermal disinfection can be done by pasteurization or in an automated washer disinfector. I'm not only going to talk today about how to validate the thermal disinfection procedure in a washer disinfector because this is the most commonly used. You can do that in two ways, uh, with thermocouples of with, or with ampules. And um, there are two approaches. So Jason, can you tell me more about the A sub zero value measurement? Yeah, Lisa, it's based on physical measurements. Um, we take readings with thermocouples uh, for the devices that are present in that process. Um, using that uh, data that we collect from the thermocouples, we use this equation that you see on the screen. Mm -hmm. The ASA value uh, is based on a reference temperature of 80 degrees C and a Z value of 10 degrees C. And um, one thing to be noted for um, intermediate use where we're concerned about user safety, surface sites can be profiled where we um, are, are not so concerned about what's going on uh, internally in those devices. So that's something to be noted. Okay. Lisa? Yeah, perfect. And then the other one is the more Let's say if you know chemical disinfection very well, the bacterial lock reduction, that's the other approach that's more based on a microbiological lethality, where you're actually going to take microorganisms in ampules or in direct inoculation on the device, where you uh, put the, the, the inoculated device in your washer disinfector and you're going to see how many bacteria were killed after the process. And that's mostly used for respiratory devices. So there are two approaches. And they're more or less equivalent. But what is important to notice is that the A sub zero method is something that is very much uh, demanded or is the preferred method for the European uh, market, whereas the log reduction approach is something that for the US market, uh, the authorities would like you to have that data as well. So if you're putting your device on the European and the US market, it is pos possible that you have to perform these two types of validations. Uh, if you're only choosing one market, make sure you use the right approach. Now, what are the criteria for these thermal disinfection validations? So you have three levels or three hills or hills in the desert that you need to cross over. So you have LLD, which stands for low level disinfection. That is a lethal process that kills most of the vegetative uh, organisms, but more heat resistant organisms, you're not going to kill them. And that is commonly used for non-critical devices, devices that come in contact with uh, intact skin, for instance. Then you have a little bit of higher level of disinfection is the intermediate level disinfection, where you are going to kill veg vegetative cells, but also mycobacteria and some spores. And then that's also for non-critical devices. Um, or devices that will be sterilized after disinfection. And then you have high level disinfection. It's the most, the highest level of disinfections, the most uh, resistant 
organisms will be killed except for large numbers of bacterial spores. And that is more for three critical devices, which uh, can come in contact with mucous membranes, so uh, a little bit less, uh, more critical than the known ones. For critical devices, it is always recommended to end with sterilization uh, processes, which uh, Jason will discuss later in this webinar. Now, if you take the bacterial log reduction approach, then for the low level disinfection, you have to demonstrate a six log reduction for four vegetative bacteria, which is E. coli, Pseudomonas, Staphylococcus, and uh, Klebsiella species. There you take ampules. For intermediate level disinfection, you have to show a six log reduction for the same four vegetative bacteria and one mycobacterium species, but there you only have to show a three log reduction. And for a high level disinfection, you have to show a six log reduction of a mycobacterium species, which has to be a thermophilic mycobacterium. So make sure that the mycobacterium species that you choose is a one that can is very resistant to heat to challenge the process as much as possible. And that's very important in the selection of your organism that you take that if you want to claim a high level of disinfection. Now, when you look to the A sub zero approach, there is actually not really such a thing as low level intermediate, but to make it more clearly, low level disinfection is, it's a mirage, just don't go there. For some devices, intermediate level disinfection is uh, required, specifically when it's just an intermediate uh, process where you just want to protect the, uh, the users in the healthcare industry who is going to move the device to, for instance, the, the sterilization part. And there you need to have an A sub zero value above 600. And generally these are temperatures uh, 90 degrees Celsius for one minute. And then you have high level disinfection where the A sub zero method has to be above 3,000, five minutes at 90 degrees or two and a half minutes at 93 degrees. It is so that, for instance, in Germany, they always want you to demonstrate A sub zero above 3,000, even for intermediate high level, doesn't matter if you do thermal disinfection, this is what they want. So for the European market, you mostly go for A sub zero above 3,000. Now here is just a slide to give you an idea of different thermal disinfection parameters for the different countries uh, in Europe. As I said, in Europe, this is the preferred method, the A sub zero method. And you can see with the values that I showed you, these are more or less uh, the same. So five minutes, 90 degrees or two and a half minutes at uh, 93 degrees Celsius. So just an overview to give you an idea that they're more or less in line. Now, when do you have to perform a thermal disinfection validation? As you can see on the slide for, Euro for Europe, when you describe in your IFU that there is a thermal disinfection process, then it is a must to validate it according to the A and uh, using the A sub zero approach. For the US market, you're more lucky. If it's an end process, of course, uh, it is the final step, you have to validate it. If it's an intermediate step, for instance, prior to sterilization, then you can validate it, but it's not necessary. You have then only to validate your final step, so you don't need to really include it. Of course, if you're again applying for both markets, you have to validate it and you must make sure that it's the A sub zero method for the European market. So now it's going to get warmer and I give the word to Jason to discuss about steam sterilization validation. Thank you, Lisa. Okay, steam sterilization. Um, there are some definite benefits to using steam, um, specifically saturated steam. It is the most widely used method in healthcare settings. It's very dependable. We, we understand it very well. It's non-toxic. There is a rapid killing action um, and it's relatively inexpensive. So it's a, a great option for a device that can handle high heat. So let's talk a little bit about gravity displacement. Uh, depending on who you ask, uh, there, there is a, this is a less preferred method um, than uh, pre-vacuum steam sterilization, which we will talk about as well. With gravity displacement, we are, um, just like the name 
implies we are displacing air from the chamber using gravity, using steam uh, and gravity to push that air out. So steam enters the chamber and air is displaced through a vent, which is your drain, until the specified temperature and pressure is achieved. It's used for products that allow effective air removal and steam contact. So we're, we're talking very simple devices. And typical sterilization phases, you can see on the slide, are purge or charge, exposure, exhaust, drying, and vacuum relief. Be careful when you're validating uh, gravity steam sterilization. As you can see, there's a mirage. Um, this is generally not preferred in the EU, and um, in the US, uh, pre vacuum is the most common that would be the most common methods that we use. So I, I did mention this uh, pre vacuum steam sterilization. Uh, it's referred to as dynamic air removal. There's also a, a cycle type called steam flush pressure pressure pulse that is a dynamic air removal cycle as well. It, it just does not employ vacuums. With pre-vacuum, as the name implies, we are using vacuums. This effectively removes air from the chamber and replaces it with steam. And we remove the air by using a series of steam pulses and vacuums. It's used for products consisting of porous materials having cavities where air is difficult to remove. So your more complex devices are going to perform better in a dynamic air removal cycle. So typical sterilization phases can include uh, air removal, which is generally referred to as conditioning. We have a charge phase, exposure phase, exhaust, drying, and vacuum relief. And just be aware, it's getting warmer. We need to make sure that our devices are going to withstand the high heat of sterilization. That gets us to product design considerations for steam sterilization. We need to make sure that we can withstand the high heat and the high moisture that you're going to see with the steam sterilization process. We need to be able to withstand those changes, so ramp rates with pressure and high temperatures. Our devices need to be designed for adequate air removal and steam penetration. If we can't get the air out, we can't get the steam in. And our devices need to maintain functionality after sterilization. They need to be able to handle those high temperatures and that high humidity content, otherwise, we need to look for another sterilization modality. So going further, here are some additional uh, sterilization considerations. For device design, we want materials that heat up quickly and remain hot. Metal is a great material for a device that's going to be steam sterilized although that's not always possible. There are also polymers that we can use. We want to limit blind holes, dead-ended lumens, and insulated lumens. Insulated lumens in particular can be very difficult to steam sterilize. Cannulas and entire device need to allow for air removal and steam penetration. For the tray, we need to make sure that our tray is designed correctly as well. We want to make sure that we do not overload our tray. In, um, in the US, we have a weight limit of 25 pounds for a fully loaded tray. That is not only for um, safety purposes, somebody moving the tray, but it's also because we need to make sure that we can sterilize everything in that tray effectively. We need to make sure that we have proper steam flow throughout the tray that our holders, the brackets that hold the devices, have limited contact with the device. 
the more area they contact, the more area we need to worry about being able to achieve sterilization. And we don't want those holders to block steam. The holders need to allow the devices to be in an unlocked and open position. When we lock a device, that device can become much more difficult to sterilize. So whenever possible, we want those to be unlocked and open. We want to make sure that we distribute the mass throughout the tray in an even manner and that we do not stack devices on top of each other. Problems in the design. Here's a mirage. We need to be careful. Large mass can present issues. Large mass surrounding cannula, like I mentioned, or lumen can cause steam penetration issues. We see problems with steam penetration and sterilization. What happens is we see condensation because of the insulation and that can actually block or exclude steam from penetrating further into that cannula or lumen. And large mass can cause a lot of condensation which can contribute to drying issues. Occluded areas can be problematic. Steam, it, those present steam penetration issues. And cannulas or lumens can cause problems. Long tubing can be difficult to sterilize. We need to remove the air from that tubing and replace it with steam. So yeah, these are very good tips, Jason, I think, uh, with all the design things. And uh, once we know which devices, uh, what we need to take into account when we design our devices, we I think we can pack our bags and, and go further on this road trip. But, I used to, when I pack my bag, so originally when I was backpacking, I put as much as possible in my in my backpack <laughs> to make sure that I did not forget anything. But walking around, it, it, it became more challenging. Running was impossible. So I would always recommend everybody now, and specifically in the desert, when it's warm, you don't want to carry as much. And also your camels have also limited capacity for carrying things. So if you can group your devices, if you have a, a, a large series or a an amount, a number of devices, you can do family grouping according to ISO 17664 or TIR 12. And your grouping criteria are based on the design of your device, which Jason just described, the weight, the packaging differences, and so on. And then you will select representatives of your different groups, one, two, three. It depends, of course, on your set of devices. The advantage is, of course, that you don't have to carry so much devices with you, but it means also that you don't have to perform a validation of each of your devices, but only for the representative of that group. So from a timing perspective, it will save you time. It will cost you less because you have to perform less uh, validations. But what you, of course, need is expert input like Jason's on sterilization. And you have to do, of course, the worst case device selection. You have to choose the representatives for your uh, groups. That's very important. That's when you can win time and money. You can take time to drink an extra glass of water because, as you can see, the water bottle is present. It is really a tip that we want to give to you. When you're going in this warm area, don't take too much things with you, but only take the relevant things with you, which are, of course, relevant for steam sterilization. Once you have done that, you can go actually to the validation of your process. And that consists of Three different steps, three individual validation. Step one, sterility assurance validation. Step two, dry time. And then step three, temperature profiling. So Jason, uh, you're going to explain step one, one of the most important steps. Yes, thank you, Lisa. Um, the sterility assurance validation. This is where we're going to validate the lethality delivered to our medical What is a sterility assurance validation? When we do a sterility assurance validation for reusable, reusable medical devices, we are going to use what's considered to be the most resistant organism, which is Geobacillus sterothermophilus. This organism has a defined resistance, it needs a defined population in order to validate our process. We, as mentioned, we use the overkill method to determine the sterility assurance level delivered to our medical devices. Those BIs containing Geobacillus sterothermophilus are placed in the most difficult to sterilize areas. 
depending on your device, that could be lumens, mated surfaces, cannulas, and areas that present heat sinks or thermal challenges. So here are the steps that we go through when we perform a sterility assurance validation. We need to select our inoculation locations and methods. Once we've done that, we will inoculate the product, we will package it, we will program a half cycle time and process those inoculated devices. We'll perform a BI sterility test and we'll score that for growth once incubation is complete. So let's talk about product inoculation first. You'll see on the slide, this is, um, the, there are several images of devices being inoculated for uh, SAL validation. You can see that we use uh, different types of carriers. We like to use four strips, but those often will not fit into the areas that we need to get into. So we also will use spores delivered on sutures, mini strips, uh, wire material, and whatever else we need to do to get those spores into the appropriate locations. That may even include the use of direct inoculation on a device where we put that spore suspension directly into a medical device and then dry it. And you can see here in this slide, here are just a few examples of areas we might choose for a SAL validation see that we've chosen this ratchet handle that has an insulated lumen. These can be very challenging to be uh, for steam sterilization and uh, that's something that we would definitely choose in a tray such as this. So once we've inoculated our product we need to package it. So we have different types of packaging available to us. Um, the type of medical device that we are sterilizing and the way that medical device is presented for sterilization will oftentimes drive this selection. So we can use pouches. Those pouches need to have a semi-permeable membrane to allow for steam uh, air to come out and steam to go in. Uh, pouches are typically used for lightweight medical devices, small medical devices. We also have sterilization wrap available to us. This is also a semi-permeable material and it must allow for steam penetration and adequate air removal. You, you're seeing a theme here. Now we also need to make sure that that material allows for drying. There are many different types of sterilization wrap on the market and you can choose which one is best for your device. And we also have rigid containers. Rigid containers come in many different sh shapes, sizes, and materials. Uh, they may contain either perfor perforated openings where we place a filter, or they may actually have valves. And this allows for air to come out and steam to go in. And with a rigid container, we need to make sure that we not only meet the requirements for a medical device, but we also meet the requirements for that container. In the US, we can look at ANSI AMI ST77 for additional guidance on rigid containers. So once we've packaged our device, we then need to run the half cycle process. So half cycle testing, I, I want to make sure that I make a note here. We also have other methods available for validation. This presentation covers half cycle testing specifically. This is also referred to as the partial cycle approach. For other approaches, depending on your device type and what's appropriate for your validation, please contact me and I can help you make a determination here. So here we're looking at, these are typical uh, parameter sets that we would use for half cycle testing. A common cycle in the US would be a temperature of 132 degrees C for four minutes. 
So you'll see here our half cycle time. We have used a time of two minutes. So half of that time. You'll also notice that time is programmed at zero minutes. Um, many regulatory groups want us to show that we've programmed with a zero minute dry time. You can see in the other column, this is also a common US cycle, 135 degrees C. The full cycle time would be three minutes. So for our testing, we would use one and a half minutes. Okay, Lisa, yeah. can you lead us to dry time? Yeah, definitely. As you saw in, in Jason's previous slide, the dry time was set at zero minutes. And that's why in step two, the dry time specifically needs to be validated separately. And that is, of course, important why. Uh, you want to make sure that all moist, all droplets uh, are removed as much as possible from your device. You don't want any water droplets present, although you're in the desert and you're thirsty from a steam sterilization point of view. This is also an ideal situation for microorganisms to grow it. It, it will, it will uh, make their lives easier. So the drier the device, the best, and that's why you need to do that. So the complete cycle is, of course, you prepare and weigh your package, uh, you package then the, the device, then you program a full cycle with your dry time, and then you do a visual inspection and you weigh also your package. So it's important here that you always use a full cycle, whereas in the previous step, a half cycle is the most commonly used, but as Jason said, it can, of course, there are other options. What you do, of course, you do that in triplicate, so you will run that process three times, and all the validation cycles, so these three cycles must pass the criteria, which means a visual inspection, so no moisture to be observed. So if you see a droplet, that's not good, and then it fails. Even if it's only for one cycle, if the other two, you don't see anything, then still it is considered as a fail. And then the weight of the package, so you weigh the package of um, before you start your process and at, at the end, and the packaging weight cannot exceed 3%. So you, you, you look at that weight gain in percentage. But that's very important that you have these two criteria and they must pass for the three replicates uh, individually in order to claim that the dry times itself has been validated uh, appropriately. So you have first the microbiological reduction which Jason just explained, then you do the dry time validation. And then of course, the third step, and I will give the back, word back to Jason because that's a temperature profiling and that has puzzled me for, for many times now. So I'm happy, Jason, that you will uh, talk about that as well. Okay, well, let's get into it. So why do we do temperature profiling? So we need to do temperature profiling. It gives us a second way to look at what our device is doing during the cycle. We wanna make sure that that heat is getting to those areas that it needs to get to. So there are several different phases of this testing. Uh, we program our thermocouples and place them inside the product and chamber. We package the product in the same manner that we packaged it for our half cycle testing and for our drying testing. We place the thermocouples in the chamber in those areas that we need to monitor that are outside the product. We program a full cycle time and we process, and then we download that thermocouple data and we review that data. So you can see here, we talked earlier about using materials that conduct heat well. And you can see in these slides, here are two different examples of profiling on devices that have a similar mass in a similar cycle. You can see on the left, a metal device tends to heat up very quickly. If we look at the product minimum uh, readings that are in blue, you can see that that device comes up fairly quickly. Now, if we look at the silicone device on the right, you can see that with when we look at our product minimum, 
it takes much longer for that device to heat up. And that actually drags into our exposure phase, which is apparent when we look at the exposure phase of this profile. So this is one question I get a lot. When we're looking at temperature performance, what are the acceptance criteria or evaluation criteria that we need to examine? You'll see for sterility assurance level, we have very clear acceptance criteria. Uh, we want to see those BIs be completely killed. As Lisa outlined for drying time, we want to see no presence of moisture, whether that's in a weight gain or visually. And for temperature profiling, what is our criteria? Well, I would direct the user to two different documents. If you're in the EU, or you're testing for the EU, I would direct you to EN 285 to look at the profile requirements of, of that document. If you are in the US or you're testing for the US, a good document to examine would be ANSI, A-N-S-I, AMI, A-A-M-I, ST8. Those documents both outline temperature performance criteria, and those can be adapted to your devices. So, survival tips. We wanna make sure that we get through the desert okay. What happens if we see failures? We, you know, this can happen. This, this is something that we have to address from time to time. If we see a, a failure in our sterility assurance validation, we may need to look at changing the configuration of our devices. Maybe we need to evaluate the layout in a tray, or maybe we need to consider opening a device that's been closed or repositioning a device to maximize steam flow. Maybe we need to look at materials changes. Maybe if we use a, a material that conducts heat better, we might have better performance. We can also look at packaging changes. Have we selected a packaging type that is worst case where we don't need to have a worst case configuration? So these are some things we can consider. For drying time, we can also look at materials changes and configuration changes. Is there a way for us to minimize the condensation that is uh, forming during that process. Maybe we need to reduce the weight of our tray. Maybe we need to look at using materials that act at, uh, as a better conductor of heat. Or maybe we need to consider a packaging change. Maybe we can find packaging that allows for better drying. And we also can use longer dry time. This is something that is definitely allowed by the US FDA and uh, is, is an option to consider when we're going through the dry time validation. And with temperature profiling, again, you, you'll see a common theme here. We can look at configuration changes, material changes, and packaging changes. So what cycles should I validate? You can see here, we're talking about the US and the EU. So on the screen, you're seeing some common cycles available in healthcare settings in the US. Um, a very common cycle, the one that we receive the most requests to validate is, is what we have outlined here for wrapped instruments, 132 degrees C for four minutes with the drying time of 20 to 30 minutes. This is a very common cycle. However, we do have other cycles available in the US. So you may want to consider validating other cycles as well. Another common cycle is the wrapped instrument cycle at 135 degrees C for three minutes with the 16 minute dry time. And I won't go through all of these here, but you can see there are different cycles available to us. In the EU, 
common temperature for us to validate is 134 degrees C. By far, we received more requests for the EU to validate at 134 degrees C than any other temperature. There are other temperatures available, so if you have devices that can't withstand 134 degrees C, please reach out to us and we can help you there. You'll notice here that our times range anywhere from three minutes to 18 minutes. One thing that should be noted uh, about the cycle at 18 minutes, this is sometimes referred to as the prion cycle, and um, it, it's a common cycle for validation in France. So, it, when we look at all of those cycles, it can be confusing. If we want to keep it very simple, we can look at four minutes at 132 degrees C for the US or three minutes at 134 degrees C for the EU. That leads us to, is it possible for us to combine those cycles for a single validation? three minutes at 132 degrees C, where we've taken the worst case cycle temperature of the US at 132 degrees C, and we've taken the worst case time from the EU of three minutes. Is this something we can do? Well, when we look at this slide here, this gives us our answer. For the sterility assurance validation, the hybrid cycle testing can be done we have had success with this approach. You will want to check with your regulatory reviewer to make sure that they will accept this approach. However, we've had a lot of luck with it, where we use the worst case temperature and the worst case time from the two different areas of the world. For drying time, we do not recommend that we use the hybrid cycle as a testing option. For drying time, we like to break those cycles back out to those parameter sets for the US and the parameter sets for the EU. And for temperature profiling, it gets a little blurry. If we can show adequate temperature heat penetration into our device in a hybrid cycle, maybe we're profiling during our half cycle testing, then we should be okay with that approach. If we are profiling through full cycles, it's best for us to break those out and profile those separately. So we need to be careful when we're using the hybrid cycle approach and make sure that we use it where it's appropriate and avoid it where it's not appropriate. Yes, yeah, so uh, this brings us to, to more or less the end uh, of this road trip. So we have been through the, let's say, warm temperatures of thermal disinfection and then got even to the higher temperatures of steam sterilization uh, for reusable devices. So as I talked to you in the beginning and explained to you, thermal disinfection, steam sterilization, once we are performing these uh, processes, it is a black box, so we need to really rely on what the washer disinfector or the autoclave is performing and, and how it's validated to make sure that the devices are safe for use, that there are no microorganism presence that can cause any harm to the patient or the user of the device. When it comes to thermal disinfection, it's clear that for the US market, the log reduction approach is the most appropriate uh, or the, the most the accepted approach, whereas in Europe, they prefer the A sub zero approach. We have also seen that we gave away two water bottles, so you couldn't be thirsty during that explanation, and only one thing to look out for, one mirage. Uh, Jason then also explained uh, the steam sterilization validation. We have described the three steps in which are important in the validation. I've included here the, the step zero, which is, of course, the design and the family group, grouping prior to your validation. We have given out five bottles, so it's warmer, so more bottles, but also three mirages, three points for attention amongst, of course, all the other tips. Let's keep them in mind, making sure that you keep those tips, but also make sure that you uh, go through each step of the process of this validation. So with all this together, you will have your passport. If you take all these tips into account, validate the processes 
for the correct market. You will have a stamp in your passport. You will have the access to the markets because regulatory agencies will accept uh, your uh, your validation work, of course, and you're making sure that your devices are safe to be used. What's also important before I really end is, of course, that you look and check for the right accreditation. Should it be done under ISO 17025? Very important for the European market, whereas in the US, most of the validation works for reprocessing in general is performed under GLP. And of course, use your guide. You can also sit on the camel like I did today and take a good guy and a guide, an expert in, in reprocessing like, like Jason today. So I really want to thank you, Jason, for uh, joining me today on this road trip in the desert. It has been really helpful. And I, I did not Spain today, so that's also a plus for me. Although we reached 135 degrees Celsius, I think that was the highest temperature today. And with well, that... Uh, it was my pleasure to take you through. Yeah. Yeah, it was, uh, it was really nice. If you want more information on the other validation part, so there is part one on cleaning validation, part two on the chemical disinfection validation. This is the third part. Uh, you can find more on the cleaning validation using this link. It's also a road trip. As I said, the road trip for disinfection validation is in Belgium. That's uh, more my area of expertise, Belgium and the chocolates, of course. Uh, you can find it uh, through this link. If after that you are even more interested in uh, any other content, you can find that on our Nelson website uh, and, of course, our sister company, Sterigenics, who is an expert in ethylene oxide or gamma sterilization or e-beam sterilization. So there you can also find more content. If you have any questions uh, on this topic, you can reach out to me, to Jason, to our sales team. And uh, with that, I wish you a very happy day. And don't forget your water bottle. Goodbye.